Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, who at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, proclaimed him your beloved Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit, grant that all who are baptized into his name may keep the covenant they have made, and boldly confess him as Lord and Savior, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him in the Jordan River. John was wore clothing made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me coming the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and, t and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At the time, Jesus came from Nazareth in into Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son. Whom I love, with you I am well pleased. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Well, this is an important Sunday in the life of the Church. Not only is this the first Sunday after the Epiphany, but it is also the Sunday that commemorates the baptism of our Lord. This is the Sunday in our lectionary where we are urged to remember Jesus' baptism as well as our own. Now, in a typical year, this morning would look a lot different, wouldn't it? We would be celebrating and welcoming children and adults alike into our church family through baptism. We would be reciting to one another our baptismal covenant to seek and serve Christ in all persons and we chuckle at infant squeals and be captivated by their presence among us. It would be a joyful and beautiful occasion, and I'm warm that we don't have the opportunity to do that today. Of course, I look forward to the moment when we can all be together again to participate in this sacred practice, but I'm reminded this morning that though we are apart, it is truly our baptism that unites us into the family of God, even and especially in times like these. Today's text from the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, it's an abrupt departure from the first chapters of Matthew and Luke that we've been hearing about all through Advent and Christmas. See, for Mark, the beginning of Christ's life isn't at the stable. It doesn't have shepherds or wise men or a star or even a baby. For Mark, the story of the gospel begins in the wilderness with John the Baptist and Jesus standing in the River Jordan. Now, many of you already know that the gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel, and it was also likely the first one written. See, Mark, he doesn't like to get caught up in the details. He wants to just stick to what happened. He was trying to get the word out about Jesus very quickly, and so his narrative carries with it an energy and a laser focus on what he deems most important. So with all of the excitement and the enchantment associated with the Christmas story, why does Mark skip over all of it and begin his gospel with Jesus's adult Baptism. See, as it turns out, 
Throughout history, both the gospel writers and the Christian church at large have had theological trouble with Jesus' baptism. Neither Matthew, Mark, or Luke give us very many of the particulars about the event, and well, the Gospel of John just skips over it completely. We learn in Mark that people from the entire Judean countryside have come to the Jordan River to see this wild and unruly John the Baptist. But the text says that not only were the people there being baptized, but they were also there to confess their sins. The act of baptism in Mark is inextricably linked with some sort of confession or repentance. And there is the trouble. See, that pesky Jesus is acting in a way completely opposite of what we prefer. It makes sense for Jesus to stand on the shore cheering and encouraging this group of sinners to a new way of life. It makes even more sense for Jesus to step in for John, give him a break, and take on the task for himself. As the Son of God, his offering of forgiveness and mercy would surely go a long way, right? But Jesus does something unexpected. Rather than watching from the sidelines, Jesus gets right down there in the action, standing in line to be baptized and associating himself with offenders left and right. And when Jesus' turn for his dunk finally arrives, something even more remarkable happens. The world is one way when Jesus enters the water, and it's something altogether different when he comes back up. Mark writes that just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my Son, the Beloved, and with you I am well pleased. Now most of my life I've considered this scene to look like something of a fairy tale. <laughs> I sort of imagined a cartoon-like scene where a once gray sky has the clouds sort of part and then light comes through, the sun just shines through, and then of course a delicate dove, actual dove, would come down from heaven and just sort of perk on Jesus's shoulder. But it wasn't until recently that a pastor of mine, a friend, pointed out the word that Mark uses here to describe the scene. As I mentioned before, if Mark carefully and deliberately chose every word he used to complete his gospel narrative, perhaps we should also carefully and deliberately consider each word he writes. The truth is that when Mark describes this moment of the heavens opening, he doesn't use passive or delicate language. No, he says the heavens were torn. In the Greek, it's schizomenus, torn, split, ripped apart when a voice from heaven proclaims, You are my beloved. It's at this very moment at the beginning of Mark's gospel story that God will go to any length, ripping the heavens wide open to remind his son of the most important truth, that he is loved. We don't see this word again, schizomenus. We don't see it again until the very end of Mark. When after Jesus breathes his last, the curtain of the temple is torn from top to bottom. Perhaps this is the moment when God is ripping the heavens apart to say to you and to me, you are my beloved, and in you I am well pleased. See, as, as I grow older, I've learned that perhaps the hardest part of all of this, this whole Christianity thing, the most difficult thing for me to believe is that there is nothing I can say or do or have or become 
that will keep me from the love of God. That over and over and over again, God is tearing through every obstacle to remind me of the simple fact that I, that you, are God's beloved child in whom God finds delight and pleasure. And that is the good news. That is the truth that we can hold on to, that through the incarnation, Jesus came into this world, into the muck and the mire, associating with sinners like you and like me, to experience the fullness of humanity because of God's great and unimaginable love for us. In this brief but essential season of Epiphany, may you and I seek out signs of hope, reminding us of our place in the family of things. May the miracle of Christmas continue to refresh us and surprise us in the days and weeks to come. And may we always remember that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything in the present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, ministers, pastors, and elders and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world that there may be justice, peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light um, penetrate shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Indian Hill Church family, uh, this morning I ask you to join me in a prayer for the human family, that our divisions may cease, that our country may heal, and that we may continue to live into our dream of being one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. This is a prayer for the human family. Oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth. That in your good time, all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And now, may the love of God, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of us and all of us this day and forever. Amen.